But we're going to start with uh, Green Party co-leader Marama Davison, who I can just see coming back into shot. So we won't quite go to Marama before she's there, because if we went to you too soon, Marama, it would have been an empty screen, but it's not. So welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, BHN. First time you on it for us. And obviously, you know, Muktas. And yes. um, we really wanted to touch base with you to sort of give us an over... It's kind of a week that was at Parliament. So as sort of the one person in this group who has spent some of the week that was at Parliament, why don't you you tell us of your experiences from this week? Morena, Pat. Lovely to see you again, Muktas. It's really lovely to see you both this morning. Um, the week that was at Parliament chaos outside I guess it's really hard for me to call it a protest because those of us who are staunch about the right to protest good and hard do not want to be associated with that that was happening outside yeah. the chaos of it the un the unhinged fundamentals at the bottom of it and pushing it behind it the lack of cohesive purpose and values and tikanga um and of course as as you know i know Magnus knows very well about and yourself pat the it ignores the underlying sort of hatred um outright white supremacist driver when we call it a protest so it's i've been trying to think of another word but it was just utter chaos and hateful and so what I, you know, I was standing there at the window looking out and seeing people getting very hurt. The, I, people know that I am not um, and never want to uphold a narrative of police as heroes. What I do acknowledge is the courage and the step change that the Greens and, and Māori and activist communities have long been calling for with a de-escalation approach and a harm minimization approach and um and then and then just to see people getting hurt in front of your eyes and your workplace is always going to rock you um, mm. it's violence it's violence and violence should not sit well with us ever no matter who is involved and fire in this context has a visceral violent nature about it it was setting on light um, hundreds of year olds, Pahutakawa tree and native trees and children's playgrounds. And, you know, I'm, not, I'm also not about this weird uh, protection of material property, which has a neoliberal sort of capitalist vibe to it. But seeing our special places, our community places desecrated and the whenua of mana whenua desecrated in this way has been um, chaos. Um, Really, mamai and sad, I guess, is the other word I was I would use to describe it. Mamai and sad because those grifters, those those influencers, the people who have been whipping up disinformation and conspiracy theory to gather crowds to for the purpose of chaos, creating chaos. Where the hell were they? They weren't at the front line. We saw brown yeah. people. I saw my own people right there throwing bricks, lighting fires, throwing gas canisters. I saw my own people with such hate and fury, absolute fury in their hearts. I saw my own people not listening to our people, not listening to mana whenua, not listening to tr trampling on Tamaiti and calling him a kūpapa. <laughs> you know, that was sad. And the work we have to do to restore, to connect back to our people who have been completely taken and enamored and so that they know that we love them more than Trump. That is some de-radicalization work that is really overpowering us in terms of the enormity of it right now. But I guess, so back to your original question, Pat, it was chaos and sad is how I would sum it up. Mark, does you got anything you want to jump in with? Um, yeah, I think when I was, you know, watching everything unfold and and the coverage of it too, I was quite taken aback with like how we tried to make sense of things and why, um, you know, people were saying why are all these brown people there? And you know, if you stand next to a Nazi and you don't say anything to the Nazi, does that make you a Nazi? Um, 
And it's been really making me think of how, how, how do we get there? Right? Like, how do these, how do these rabbit holes become so attractive for people? And I wonder if, if the ways in which we articulate problems, if we want simplistic solutions, you want to be able to make sense of things, right? And because it's really hard to hold information that might be contradictory at times. So then people line up because we're not giving people space to hold complex information. And then they say, well, you know, it's either, you know, big pharma is evil um, or, you know, like you're kind of blindly endorsing everything. So I was like, but you can, you can have a critique of, you know, big pharma in ways that doesn't necessarily negate the other, um, you know, the yeah. facts, and the scientific facts around vaccines, right? Like those are not mutually exclusive mm -hmm. positions. And I think the less space we create for that to actually talk about these issues, the more it aligns the people who might have some legitimate grievances, because mm -hmm. I don't want to say, you know, all grievances were kind of illegitimate, um, is that people who have legitimate grievances don't have a place to take those grievances. And then they mm -hmm. go to the people who will say, oh, we are the ones who want nuance, who are questioning everything, so you can come here. And that's where people kind of gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. and I see something similar, I, I have to say, I see something similar now with the situation between Ukraine and, and Russia. Yeah. We really have this need to say, I need to know who's the bad guy and yeah. the good guy um, to make sense of this. And actually what happens is, is I'm not making an argument for like, it's all relative. Let's have both sides in every conversation. That's not the mm -hmm. argument I'm making. I'm actually saying the more complexity we have, the more precise we can analyze the situation. So it's not about, let's have nuance. I'm actually talking about precision. And precision is about allowing um, some of these, you know, conversations to go somewhere productively. Yeah. So I think that's been like one of my concerns. But the other one that I saw was how hard it was for New Zealand to name right-wing ideology, right-wing ideology. And yeah. it, it almost felt like that because people didn't have shaved heads and black boots, yeah. that they couldn't see it. And, and I was talking to a um, common friend of Marma and, Ma and mine, and I was like, and, you know, we were talking, and he said, you know, why is it you think people can't see it? And I said, I don't know. As somebody who grew up in Germany, you could you could spot people. Like, it's something that you learned to do, particularly around protests, because you didn't want those people to come and co-opt your movements. So you would always look around, and yes, some of them had shaved heads, but the vast majority of them didn't. Um, so, like, people who were saying things that aligned with, you know, fascist ideology or, you know, alt-right ideology, like, you can detect that. It doesn't necessarily have to be extremely explicit, even though I think it was also extremely explicit at the protest. But I thought, like, I was like, that is saying something to us. If we're expecting people to show up um, and look like the Nazis out of some 1980s movie, um, that is not going to happen. They're going to, you know, be more polite and well-dressed and sophisticated and educated and it's going to become increasingly more difficult to, to point out some of the flaws in these narratives that people present which is why they're you know that's why people gravitate towards them because they know um what grievances people have and giving them a space to come and express their grievance is what people have done right like they're like come here all of these different grievances it's all about the mandates when really um the driving force I think um, wasn't quite clearly about that. So many of what you're saying is resonating so much, and <clears throat> for me, the grievances that you're that you're referring to, Mathis, is actually trauma and understanding then what a trauma informed approach mm -hmm. actually needs to look like as we try and restore and recover from this, and understanding what led to it is very much yeah. needing a trauma informed. Um, conversation and trauma-informed responses and specialisms and um, I love what you said I was writing it down uh, precision because you know the glaring uh, contradiction is that so many of us and even myself being in the crown so many of us for our lives have dedicated ourselves to naming the fact that absolutely government and systems have been oppressive you know um, we absolutely understand and have been fighting to change oppressive systems and know that oppressive systems have traumatized our people over many generations. 
And yet somehow our collective movements still didn't pick everyone up mm -hmm. so that everyone could see that we are collectively working to overthrow and recreate and re-indigenize loving systems instead of oppressive systems. So somehow we're all feeling really mum because we're all like, oh, we failed. How have our generations of movements, of resistance, of struggle, of connected values still managed to miss some of our people? And that precision that you refer to and the fact that facts and science were never going to resonate, were never going to combat people falling down into rabbit holes. It all had to, it, it actually for me is all summed up by people needing connection. They connected to white supremacy. They connected to Trump. I have aunties flying Trump flags on the lawn. Wow. Um, Co-opting tenoranga, tiratanga and whakaputanga flags with their Trump flags right next and outwardly saying, I'm a big fan of Trump. He's brought peace and healing to the world. What? So we missed some of our people and it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And it's not so much that there is, you know, valid concerns is one way of putting it. I put it down to legitimate grievance. Absolutely. Legitimate grievance. And that has been difficult to see for quite some time but it was pronounced markedly in what we saw a couple of days ago hey um Mara, we, we're, going to, we're going to have to leave it there because we have uh john minto coming on in a couple of secs to talk sure, to yeah. us about about the protest and the uh the media response to comparing it or not to what happened in 81 um but one very quick question and hopefully it's a one or two word answer is at any stage during that week did you find yourself personally fearful for your own safety in the week that many went with times. the protest going on? You did. Many times. Yeah. So it impacted impacted all sorts of parts, not just it was a it was a dangerous time. It was a yeah. I, I was personally harassed and intimidated in public while trying to um, accept a petition from another organization who ironically right. are about saving children. Um, it was purposefully intimidating and harassing. That was what they set out to do. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Marama, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, First time we've had you on, and I hope we see you a lots and lots and lots more Me over too. the forthcoming days, weeks, months, and hopefully years. Fingers crossed with how this goes. Uh, be safe, and um, yeah, and and I kind of want to say thank you to you and and all the politicians for sort of standing as one last week, mm -hmm. uh, and this week just gone and saying, I think what the majority of New Zealand agreed with, which is, you know, you know from my perspective, time to move on. This is not us. And so so well done for, for being brave and being there. And thank you from me, at least, to you and to the other politicians who did that as well. Uh, thank you both. It's been wonderful hanging out with you this morning. I definitely need to come back. <laughs>